Mr. Abraham, ladies and gentlemen, I must first begin by thanking Minna, the person with whom I have been corresponding for the over one year now. And I'm here because of her. She has been a persistent correspondent and um, didn't give up despite my um, postponing my arrival here on a couple of occasions. <laughs> It's a persistence that has finally um, made me make sure that I spend a day in Kochi. It's a coincidence that it is exactly 39 years to the week uh, that I first came to Kerala. I came in September 1976 uh, to study at the Center for Development Studies, uh, Trivandrum. My classmate Raju Kuri is also here. We were classmates at CDS in uh, Trivandrum with Professor K. N. Raj uh, set up. So it's almost uh, exactly 39 years since I first came here. You are asking me if I've been to Kochi before. I've been to Kochi and Trivandrum and many other places many, many times. And it's always a pleasure uh, to be back uh, in Kerala. Um, so first of all, second, I must thank you for your very kind words. It's always a pleasure to meet someone who's actually read my book. Uh, because I often meet people who have opinion about the book without having read the book. Uh, and in the last year or so, I've traveled around the country speaking about it and answering questions from people who have actually not read the book. And, and, and then you realize that you know whatever they're asking is based on perceptions about the book. So it's always a pleasure, sir, uh, to meet someone who has actually read it and, and, and has understood what, what the book is all about. Um, but today I'm not speaking about my book. Uh, I'm speaking on a subject which is actually slightly different from the title. I think when I got the email um, mentioning this title, I, I was preoccupied with something else and forgot to reply, uh, suggesting a slight change. And then I left it, and then I suddenly found it was announced. So I, I, I didn't bother to correct it. I don't want to speak only about foreign policy of Narendra Modi is still one year. My friend Raja Mohan has written a book recently. I've uh, written about it. He writes for the Indian Express, which I assume comes to, to, uh, to Ernakulam. Um, and if there are any questions, particularly on some of the recent controversies, I'm quite happy to express my opinion. What I want to really do, since we are here in, in, in Kochi, and at a center that is focusing on strategic affairs and strategic policy, is to offer what I regard as my understanding of Indian foreign policy. And of course, I will come to the whole issue of what is Prime Minister Modi's um, own contribution to this perspective. The, my simple argument, which I have developed in the book, which has been referred to, the strategic consequences of India's uh, economic performance, I think. Uh, so Tarakan was present when that book was launched in Delhi, if I'm not mistaken, at the Taj Hotel in 2006. No, you're not there. Uh, when I was in the PMO. Um, what I tried to do in that book um, is to put together uh, various essays I have been writing over a period of time. And let me summarize my argument at the very beginning before I develop it. I think India's, the, the focus of Indian foreign policy um, even during the national movement and immediately after independence, was a very single, singular objective of India's economic development, of eliminating poverty, once again taking India back to the status it enjoyed before colonial rule came to India. That was the primary objective. But the politics of the Cold War confused a lot of issues because of which there was a dilution of this focus. We made several mistakes ourselves in terms of our economic policies, as a result of which uh, I think we had a period in which there was no clarity on what exactly were our strategic objectives. And I believe that after 1991, both on account of the end of the Cold War and on account of uh, India's own changes in economic policy, we have gone back to this objective that 
India's economic rise, India's uh, economic development, the elimination of poverty, the elimination of, of deprivation, and making India a major economic power is the central objective of Indian foreign policy. Everything else is secondary. That's my basic argument. And I have argued this in a variety of my publications over the years. Uh, and that's the argument I will develop. Uh, and, uh, and of course, I'll end by saying that I think this, this is the essence that Modi has understood. If you see his own speeches on foreign policy, his focus has been once again on the economy, on restoring the momentum of economic growth, on re-establishing economic links with our neighbors, uh, both to the east and to the west. And, and, and in here in Kerala, one does not have to emphasize the fundamental importance of these economic links to our own development and progress. The Kerala economy <coughs> has benefited from this tremendous link that it has to Gulf, uh, to a prosperous part of the world. And without this link, I, I shudder to think what would have happened to Kerala over the last 20 years. I think this uh, the state would have been probably in worse crisis than many of the northeastern states and, 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 and northern states. Uh, since it was incapable of making the jump to industrial development that Tamil Nadu and Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra made for a variety of political reasons. So therefore, I, I will end by saying that this argument of um, the economic link, um, which is so important for India's own development, is, is something that Kerala has understood from its own experience. Now let me begin at the very beginning. There's a very famous speech of Jawaharlal Nehru to the Constituent Assembly in December 1947, six months after he becomes Prime Minister, um, where there's a debate in the Constituent Assembly on Indian foreign policy. And at, at the end of an extensive debate, Nehru intervenes to make an extended speech on what he thinks ought to be India's foreign policy. I have actually reproduced that entire speech in my book, The Strategic Consequences, as an appendix, so those of you who are interested can actually read the full speech. But the important paragraph there is this one. Talking about foreign policies, this is Nehru, the House must remember that these are not just empty struggles on a chessboard. Behind them, like all manner of things, ultimately foreign policy is the outcome of economic policy, and until India has properly evolved her economic policy, her foreign policy will be rather vague, rather inchoate, and will be groping. A vague statement that we stand for peace and freedom by itself has no particular meaning. Because every country is prepared to say the same thing, whether it means it or not. What then do we stand for? Well, you have to develop this argument in the economic field. As it happens today, in spite of the fact that we have been for some time an authority as government, I regret that you have not yet produced a constructive economic scheme or policy. When we do so, that will cover our foreign policy." Unquote. I don't think you can get a more clearer exposition of what Dr. Abraham called realism in foreign policy as opposed to idealism. Idealism is the pursuit of certain values, peace, freedom, equality of man, of all nations, etc., etc. These are all words that one hears in speeches of, of political leaders, but at the end of the day, every country in the pursuit of its foreign policy has certain basic objectives which are about its own uh, de development. And I think this, uh, I call it Nehruvian realism, which is summed up in the sentence, and again I quote, whatever policy we may lay down, the art of conducting the foreign affairs of a country lies in finding out what is most advantageous to that country." Unquote. It's an exact quote from Nehru. And those of you who are students of international affairs will really, uh, will, will, will quickly grasp the fact that this is the essence of what we call realism in international affairs. Nehru was, in many ways, the ultimate realist, though the circumstances of the world at that time that forced India virtually to take sides in the Cold War Though we pretended to be non-aligned, we ended up being on the other side of the Western world in many, on many issues. It uh, meant that our economic interests could not be pursued as effectively 
as we ought to have. Many of the countries of East Asia, Japan, Korea, uh, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, and then the Southeast Asian economies, all of which, and including countries in West Asia like Turkey, uh, pursued a very different policy during the Cold War and benefited economically from it. We, on the other hand, sought to isolate ourselves from the world, pursued a policy of what economists call import substituting industrialization, reducing our share of world trade from 2% in 1950 to 0.5% by 1980, over a 30 year period. Our entire approach in international trade negotiations in the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, was always a defensive approach, which is that we don't want to uh, open our doors to imports. We are not interested in exports. All we need to do is to export enough to buy essential imports like food and oil. Food and oil were the two major dominant imports of the 1950s and 60s. All of that changed in 1991 for a variety of reasons. One, of course, the Cold War ended. And the Cold War ended almost at the time when India had a major economic crisis. It's, I, 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 I equate that to a young man losing his father just around the time he's finishing his college education. You can understand what happens to the family. The source of sustenance of the family is gone and you are not yet employed. You've just finished your education. And that crisis that our family faces when the head of the family passes away and, and the child is forced to then become the money uh, earner is very similar in psychological impact to the crisis that India faced in 1990. Because the world that protected this country in many ways in terms of the uh, power uh, systems of the world disappeared. The Soviet Union accounted for 16% of India's trade in 1989 and that share went down to 3% by 1992. Within three years, it collapsed. A major market. But more importantly, a friend in the UN Security Council, a friend in the U International Monetary Fund, a friend in the International Councils disappeared. But it happened at a time when India faced its worst economic crisis after 1958. The last time we had a major balance of payments crisis was in 1958 and then uh, 1991. If you read through what happened and most recently Jairam Ramesh has actually produced a book putting together all his own notes because he was in the Prime Minister's office in those three or four months and it's a, it's a, it's a good account of, factual account of what happened. Um, you know, thanks to my book, a lot of people have been inspired now to writing their own accounts of what happened when they were in government. So I, I'm delighted that you know, he also has got the courage to now finally call Narasimha Rao a great prime minister, uh, though his own party has, uh, doesn't even remember that he even existed. But what Jairam's book records is those five, four or five months. And many of us have written. I used to be with the Economic Times uh, in that period, June, June, June 1990. Uh, to the end of 92, following on a daily basis, you know, the mortgaging of gold, how gold was shipped out of the vaults of the Reserve Bank of India in Bombay and flown out by an Indian Airlines plane uh, to London because the British were not willing to give us uh, um, financial assistance unless you mortgage gold. Those were days unimaginable. For those of you who are too young to remember, the nature of that crisis, I mean, the kind of things that happened. Yashwant Sinha, as finance minister, went to Tokyo to ask if the Japanese would give us money. The finance minister of Japan kept Yashwant Sinha waiting outside his room for an hour, literally outside the room in a sofa, and then opened the door and said to Yashwant Sinha, sorry, I'm too busy, I'm in a meeting, I can't see you, my secretary will come to you, and closed the door. And the finance minister of India had to speak to the secretary of the finance minister of Japan. Those are the days when we are not great friends of the Japanese, as indeed we are today. But that was the level to which this country was reduced. So the shift in economic policy at a time when there was an international environment change had a fundamental impact on India's foreign policy. 
And, and that was, in fact, my argument in my book, which I have written <coughs> extensively, but I don't want to go into the details. But the upshot of all of that was once again, after 91, India's own economic development became the single most important objective of Indian foreign policy. Every relationship was defined by, does this help my economic development? Does this help my energy security? Does this relationship help my food security? Does this relationship help create markets for my industry, markets for my professionals? In almost every single international relationship that we pursued, whether with ASEAN, whether with East Asia, whether indeed even with China, and certainly with the Gulf, certainly with the European Union and the United States, in every single one of these relationships, Economic development, in the way in which Nehru articulated in 1947, once again became the primary objective. We stopped lecturing the world as we used to, because that was a period in which we had nothing else to do with the world, so we thought we could lecture them and, 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 and underline our own relevance to international affairs. But the world stopped hearing India. Nobody cared for India's lectures. That began to change as the Indian economy opened up and relationships of interdependence was created. The core of my own argument is that the shift that happened in the thinking, particularly among economists, but also among the political leaders, was that till the 80s, we viewed international economic relations as creating what economists used to call dependence. That if I sell to you, I'm dependent on your market. If I buy from you, I'm dependent on your technology. If I open my country to your tourists, I'm dependent on their coming. In other words, all interaction is an interaction that creates dependencies. And therefore, we view international trade, we view international relations, economic relations uh, in a negative way. And there was a lot of theory. Again, those of you who are students of economics are familiar with you know, the dependency school, the Latin American school of, of theorizing on international relations. A lot of this was theorized in economics as <clears throat> creating dependency between nations. The change that comes about is when you begin to see each of these as not creating a dependency, but creating an interdependency. That is, I need you as much as you need me. When I buy from you, I depend on you to sell. But I make you dependent on me because I'm buying. Your income depends on my expenditure. A very simple idea in economics, but that revolutionized Indian thinking on foreign affairs. That every relationship with the outside world was no longer seen as one of inequality, of, in, of dependence, but in fact was seen of, as one of equality of creating interdependence. That each of these relationships, the, the other country cannot hurt you because it is as dependent on you as you are on it. And this radical shift in thinking on economic <coughs> policy and foreign affairs, I think once again brought economics back into our thinking on foreign affairs. So when Prime Minister Modi now says in his speeches, if you have read them, that you know, Economic development is the core of my foreign policy. He's not saying anything new. He's saying, in fact, precisely what Nehru said in December 1947 and what Narasimha Rao said in 1991. In fact, in one of my recent papers, I have a quote from Narasimha Rao, which I unfortunately don't have my, on my iPad. Uh, but you know, you, I think you can Google it and get what he said to Sunday magazine in an interview to M.J. Akbar in um, 1991 or 92 uh, on Indian foreign policy. It's a very, 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 very good. Uh, I think Jairam quotes that speech in, in, in his book. Now, what I did in my book, sir, which you, which you have read in the chapter on what I call Manmohan Singh doctrine, uh, is try to summarize some of what I've just said and put it in the form of five or six elements which define Indian foreign policy in the post-Cold War era. 
I call it the Manmohan Singh doctrine, I think because Manmohan Singh, among all the Prime Ministers, was able to articulate the best uh, in a series of speeches. You can go and look at a speech he delivered at the India Today conclave in uh, uh, 2005, March 2005, at the Hindustan Times Summit in November 2004. Those are the two speeches uh, where he articulated his thinking on foreign policy. And let me quote from the, 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 the sum and substance of, of, of that approach. First, that India's relations with the world, both major powers and her Asian neighbors, are shaped by its own developmental priorities. The single most important objective of Indian foreign policy has to be to, and there's an exact quote from Manmohan Singh, to create a global environment conducive to our economic development and the well-being of its people." Unquote. Second, that India would benefit from greater integration with the world economy. The world wants India to do well. Our challenges are at home. Now this in fact is a radical formulation because much of our thinking in the post-colonial period, quite understandably and quite naturally, was that the world does not want us to do well. After all, our national movement was a product of 200 years of British colonialism, which you know, had hugely negative impacts on, on the Indian economy. The decline in the share of India in the global economic system, etc. So there was this negative view of the world. We saw <coughs> trade, international trade, or dealing with the outside world as if it was, as I said earlier, creating dependencies. But the, by the time you come to the turn of the century, and the turning point, the two phenomena that really made an impact on thinking among international relations scholars. One is what was happening here in Kerala. Again, my classmate Raju Kurian was the first economist to study the impact of remittances on Kerala's economy in 1977, right? Uh, 38 years back. But in the decades after that, 77 was what, uh, 13 years before reforms. 91 was the reform, right? 13 years before liberalization. But in the period after 91, and certainly in the last two decades, the tremendous impact that Kerala's relationship with West Asia had, and of course there's no longer only Kerala, it's about Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, other parts of the country that have benefited, showed the benefits of globalization for large numbers of people. That going out, earning money, bringing it back home was a beneficial relationship. That was the first. The second thing that happened literally at the turn of the century was the IT boom, the software. Not only did it show that India was capable of contributing to global development, but it showed that India had something that nobody else had, the software engineer. India's image changed around the world. I remember when I went to China uh, once in, around that time, probably in 98 or 99, and I was walking on the streets in Shanghai, a young chap started talking to me and you know, he, was, he knew a little bit of English. He asked me, are you from Hindu? You know, in Chinese, they say Hindu for India. So he said, are you from Hindu? I said, I'm from Hindu. Uh, IT. So I said, no, not IT. So for him, when he saw an Indian, the only thing he could ask was, are you from IT? And that was the kind of impact that uh, IT had on India's global image, that here was a country that was able to bring something to the table, to the international table, uh, which nobody else was in a position to do. And it completely altered our relationship, particularly with the Anglo-Saxon world, with the United States, with the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, the entire English-speaking world, because IT was all about English, and knowledge of maths and English. So the second formulation is the world wants India to do well. Our challenges are at home. And that India should be more closely integrated with the economies of Asia and the Western world that depend on India for their own economic development. Third, 
India's relations with major powers, especially the United States and more recently China, have increasingly been shaped by economic factors. Now, there's a lot of debate that goes on in the public domain about are we pro-US, pro-China, anti-US, anti-China. In the realist view of international relations, this is irrelevant. Because as far as India is concerned, good relations with the United States are as important as good relations with China. Because China is also a growing economy. It's a growing market. It's providing you opportunities. It's creating employment opportunities. There are literally thousands of Indian workers today, businessmen today in China. Almost every major company now has an office in Shanghai, as indeed it has in New York. So the economic integration of India with both the United States and China is rising. The difference, of course, is that we have a border problem with China. And, and that's a reality. And we are, just as we have a problem with, with Pakistan, these are, this is a reality of existence and you have to deal with it. You can't run away from it. You can't deny it. But on the other hand, international relations cannot be defined by only one factor. Just the fact that we have a difference with Pakistan on Kashmir cannot shape India's Pakistan policy. Just the fact that we differ with China on our border cannot shape India's China policy. These policies are shaped by a complex set of factors in which I would argue the dominant factor is the economic factor. In fact, if there is any problem with Pakistan, it is that there is no economic factor. Or at least that is not an important factor. There is an economic factor in the sense that, in fact, millions of dollars of trade happens between India and Pakistan, except it is all illegal. It leaves the ports of Bombay and pretends to go uh, to Dubai, but actually ends up in Karachi. And this illegal trade is a thriving business. Uh, and there are people in, in sitting in Dubai making their millions. Um, so it's not as if India and Pakistan don't have trade, but they don't have legal trade. They have, they have illegal trade. But in any case, it's the fact that we have so little trade removes the balancing element. On the other hand, with China, the fact that the trade has increased so phenomenally has restored some balance to that relationship. So it's not only about the border, that there are also other economic elements. And of course, certainly with the United States. <laughs> let, let me, you know, I think I'd like to give a lot of time for question answers. I, I, I like uh, to understand the kind of issues in your mind. So I'll quickly go through the other elements and then and try and sum up. And, and, and then address a couple of points that uh, the chairman made. The, the fourth element of what I call the Manmohan Singh Doctrine is that the destiny of South Asia is a shared destiny. Again, one can drop, build a complex argument ranging all the way from history uh, and culture to climate change as a phenomenon. That climate change is having an impact in the region that requires countries of the region, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Pakistan, India to work together. It's about changing uh, the course of our rivers. It's about snow melting in the Himalayas. It's about earthquakes. It's about deforestation. All of which are, you know, they don't believe in borders. Nature doesn't have political uh, borders. So they, these are problems that cross borders and therefore um, the destiny of, 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 of the region is mixed. And, and then of course finally the fact is that you cannot have just India prospering in this region when its neighbors are not prospering. Nor indeed can India's neighbors prosper without India prospering. They may imagine that they can have a special relationship with China and somehow take off as Sri Lanka tried to imagine for a while. But you know that's just not normal. You, know, you cannot have an adverse relationship with India and, and, and hope to develop um, in, in this part of the world. <clears throat> Finally, um, uh, on the couple of issues uh, uh, raised in the re remarks by the chairman, I, I just want to clarify that the, there's been some criticism of, of Manmohan Singh that he ignored the neighborhood and that Narendra Modi is more focused on the neighborhood. I think for Mr. Modi, the focus on the neighborhood, particularly the focus on Pakistan, uh, was politically important. From, from the point of view of establishing these global credentials that he is not a warmonger, that he 
he wants to have good relations with Pakistan. So I would see it more as um, addressing a political agenda rather than a foreign policy agenda. Because a foreign policy agenda, or as far as India-Pakistan relations are concerned, can only be addressed when Pakistan is ready to come to a settlement on Kashmir. We are ready. Manmohan Singh and Musharraf negotiated an agreement. I have written about it in my book. That's the only possible agreement. I think India would be quite happy to live with that. But obviously the Pakistanis are not yet ready. So let them take their time. If they take 10 years, 20 years, you know, I, I'm not in a hurry for uh, settling those, those issues politically. But I think the fact is that for Mr. Modi, addressing that agenda was more political. On the other hand, as far as other neighbors are concerned, I think it's true that in UPA too, Manmohan Singh could have certainly visited Nepal and uh, Sri Lanka and, and Bangladesh, and, and, but he was preoccupied with domestic policy, with politics, 2G, and all the scams that came out in UPA too. But if you go to UPA 1, <clears throat> and that's, a, that's a, uh, a point I'd like to make and stop, the focus of foreign policy, drawing from what I've said, this evening about the centrality of economic relations was to reconfigure our relations with the United States based on the assumption, sorry, not just the United States, United States and China, based on the assumption that a long-term economic relationship is a necessary foundation for political stability in Asia and the world. That a good, strong India-US relationship is a necessary condition for stability in Asia and South Asia. A good, strong India-China relationship is a necessary condition for stability in East Asia and Southeast Asia. I can elaborate on both these propositions if, if, if there are those of you who would like me to do. But let me make the two propositions and leave it at that. So when Manmohan Singh chose the nuclear deal as the focus of his policy, in that period. It was in order to remove from the table an irritant that divided the, or that spoiled the India-US relationship. It had remained an irritant from 1972 or 73, whenever we did the first nuclear test. Um, and, and that irritant had to be removed, which was the, 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 the sanctions regime against India. And the understanding was that if you have good relations with the US, you automatically get good relations with all of the major powers. Because every power in the world is seeking good relations with the US. Whether it's China, whether it's Russia, whether it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not talking of now, I'm talking of 2004. I mean, today Russia and the US have uh, very poor relations. And, and um, therefore, you know, this not a, um, may not sound valid at the moment, but in 2004, Putin and President Bush had excellent relations. In 2004, Hu Jintao and President Bush had excellent relations. To the extent that when the Chinese were dragging their feet on the vote for India in the nuclear suppliers group in September 2008, it is President Bush who picked up the phone and told Hu Jintao, vote for India. And he voted for India. That was the nature of that relationship. So improving relationship with the United States became the foundation for better relations with the rest of the world. Second, stable relations with China became the foundation for good relations with the countries to, the, to our east. Southeast Asia, um, what is this, uh, Taiwan, Malaysia, Singapore, each of these are you know, Chinese, uh, ethnic Chinese nations. And all those relationships improved as a result of, in fact, Lee Kuan Yew once famously said that India and China, and uh, you remember Lee Kuan Yew was a huge critic of India. But in 2007, I think, if my memory says, no, sorry, 2008, he gave an interview to Forbes magazine in which he said, India and China are like the two engines of a jet plane, and Asia is that plane. And for Asia to rise, both engines should be working properly. Uh, and I used to, of course, joke that, you know, given what was happening in India, in UPA too, that this Asian plane is going to go around in circles because only one engine is working and the other engine has stopped working. And I think in, in the essence what Modi's project has been, 
is to get the other engine working. And this is the point with which I will stop. That unless the Indian engine fires, unless the Indian economy grows 7-8%, unless India's share of world trade increases, unless India is more open to you know, international investment, <clears throat> unless India has sustains these economic relations that it is around the world, the world would not be interested in India. And because after all we are talking about a relationship in an interdependent world. Let me stop with this and I'll be quite happy to take it.